everyone and um, I hope that you start the week well, uh, of course, in uh, relation, always keeping in mind the, the tragic events in Ukraine, which are not uh, without relevance uh, for what we are going to do uh, this morning. And we are going to launch a report over which the ECF, uh, the European Alliance to Save Energy, and Cambridge Econometrics have been working over one year with uh, um, several regular meetings. Uh, but I think that uh, Femke and Stein will explain you better. But I just wanted to say that uh, to talk about why the transition to energy efficiency, efficient and electrified buildings strengthen the European economy is particularly important because you probably noticed that uh, among the reactions that we are having um, on what is happening uh, today in Ukraine, but also on, on the significance that uh, what happens in Ukraine and our dependence from gas and Russian gas in particular, Russian fossil fuel in particular, there is a whole lot of reflections which are actually not all going in the right direction and certainly are not putting very much at the center uh, energy efficiency in buildings, industry and transport. So I believe that the numbers and the big work that has been done uh, over this, uh, these reports, because in reality we are presenting today two reports, um, is quite relevant also to help policymakers and us uh, as operators of energy efficient, uh, energy efficient industry and civil society to be even more effective or at least to try to be more effective and to put again at the center uh, of the conversation energy efficiency. So um, the, uh, I said that there are two reports because we have a technically and a summary report on the socioeconomic impact of decarbonizing the EU residential building stock by 2050, um, we speak about, we will hear a lot this morning, words like uh, electrification, notably through heat pump, high efficiency, uh, notably uh, through a very high uh, increase of the uh, renovation rate from 1.5 to, to 3.5 scenarios. And uh, we will check how this scenario performs. Um, I think that there are also some unexpected results of this uh, of this study, and it would be interesting also to uh, to go through them. Just on a methodology point of view, we are going to have uh, a lot of a lot more information about how the methodology went. But beside the three actors of this report, we have been working for over a year with a very high level panel. Uh, of people, uh, so a lot of them, you see them here and will take the floor. And I want to take the occasion to thank them uh, for their participation, which has been uh, very much uh, continuous over this, uh, uh, this, uh, this year. And we are, of course, extremely honored to have with us uh, um, Kieran Kufe, who is the rapporteur on the EPBD, and uh, who is actually uh, the person that we probably will have to help uh, more than others um, in order to put this, uh, um, these results into uh, reality and, uh, let's say, in, into, uh, into the European legislation. But uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor um, to Femke de Jong which, uh, from ECF, which is actually uh, the one who commissioned the study uh, and uh, who has conducted the study with us, uh, and I would say led the study with, uh, uh, with, the three, uh, with the three actors. And Femke, you have the floor, and thank you very much for your work with us. It has been a very interesting and positive uh, example of cooperation, even if, of course, you are a funding member of the European Alliance to Save Energy. Please, you have the floor, Femke. Thanks, Monica, and uh, hello, welcome all. I'm gonna try and share my screen. I guess you can see it now. Uh, many thanks to all for joining this event today. Um, I will keep it short because many things have already been said by Monica and Stein will afterwards explain the study's approach and the key findings. So this project indeed started over a year ago uh, with the main objective of analyzing the socioeconomic impacts of decarbonizing the building stock by 2050 at the latest. 
And the aim was to find out what the economic impacts would be of completely phasing out the use of fossil fuels for heating and cooling um, homes. So what are the impacts on Europe's GDP, job creation, energy security, and disposable incomes? And are these impacts different when green hydrogen is used for heating compared to if Europe's heating demand is met primarily by heat pumps? What happens when a low renovation rate is targeted instead of a high renovation rate? And what could be the trade-offs? And during this process, we were indeed supported by an expert panel uh, with individuals from the organizations that are listed on this slide. And we are indeed extremely grateful for their input and support during this process. Um, of course, the situation today is very different um, than when um, the work on this study started over a year ago. And let me just clarify that this study was originally not designed to answer the question how fast Europe can cut the use of Russian gas imports for home heating. But it does show that doing so will provide numerous other benefits for Europe's society. Renovating and electrifying Europe's building stock will deliver significant socioeconomic benefits. But this will not happen automatically. So today, buildings are still responsible for 36% of the EU CO2 emissions and up to half of the EU's total gas consumption. Dedicated policies and financing measures are therefore required to accelerate the reduction of fossil fuel consumption in buildings, while also making sure that all European citizens can take advantage of the associated uh, socioeconomic benefits. And this will be further discussed by the panel discussion after Stein's presentation. Um, I want to thank everyone for their interest uh, in this debate, and I will now give the floor to Stein for a presentation on the study's key findings. Stein, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think Sophie is going to bring up my slides and walk through that. Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's Melina, and I'm, I'm just going to do it in, in a second. I'm opening it now. It should be uh, visible in a minute. Thanks. Brilliant, thanks. Okay, so if you could move to the next slide. Um, so just a few words um, about myself. So uh, I head of the Brussels office at Cambridge Econometrics and um, I led this study together with um, with a few colleagues. Um, so Pim Verkoolen, um, who, um, who is a senior modeler in the, um, in the modeling team at Cambridge Econometrics and uh, Finn, uh, Finn Barton Hendrik, um, who is also a modeler um, in, at Cambridge Econometrics and uh, John Stenning, um, who's the head of environment. Um, so I'll start by saying um, a few uh, more words about uh, the methodology that we have followed. Um, I think Femke and um, others have already highlighted uh, the objective, the main objective um, of the study. Um, so in total, uh, six workshops uh, with experts and stakeholders uh, were organized to discuss data inputs, assumptions, uh, methodology, and scenario design. On the basis of these inputs, we constructed a building stock model uh, to project forward the number of dwellings in the EU and the energy needed for heating and cooling uh, from these dwellings, depending on their energy efficiency. Uh, we then added a heat supply module to look at different pathways as to how the energy need for heating and cooling can be met using different combinations of zero carbon technologies and the resulting final energy demand and total costs of ownerships uh, for these various technologies. Uh, the final step was to use uh, the um, E3ME model, uh, so which is the, the macroeconomic model um, developed by Cambridge Econometrics um, over the last few decades um, in order to assess the effects on the wider economy of the corresponding changes in household spending and investments. Um, so in other words, the corresponding changes um, in technologies lead to macroeconomic impacts and those are captured uh, with the E3ME model. 
Um, in the following slides, I will be using the visualizations of the summary report uh, written by the European Climate Foundation and the European Alliance, um, uh, and that was written for uh, policymakers. Uh, the full detail and other visualizations can be found in the technical report published on our website and also on the website of the European Climate Foundation. Before I move on to the next slide, um, there are just a few points I'd like to emphasize, uh, which are important um, for people to understand um, how we've gone about um, the scenario modeling. Um, so first of all, the scenarios should be seen as what if scenarios. Um, so they are not forecasts of what is most likely to happen or what we think is most likely to happen, but assumption based pathway scenarios uh, with the objective to assess and compare economic impacts between them. Second, um, we used the best available um, recent data and assumptions we were able to find, all that have been suggested to us by the experts on the panel. Um, Cambridge Econometrics itself is an independent organization and has no stake in, in this debate. Uh, third, the energy price projections um, were made assuming that the world is stable and in line with long-term trends, um, so we surely hope uh, that current events are short-term. Um, so the, the next slide, um, uh, present, no, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? Yes, thanks. Um, so all in all, we ended up um, with 10 different scenarios, which we compared to a business as usual baseline of which six are described in more detail on this slide. Um, first of all, uh, we project the building stock to 2050, assuming on the one hand a low renovation rate and on the other hand a high renovation rate, thus ending up with a highly efficient building stock and a less efficient building stock in 2050, each leading to different levels of energy uh, of demand for heating and cooling, basically. Um, in the low efficiency version, uh, the weighted renovation rate is assumed to reach 1.5% around 2030. Um, and in the high efficiency uh, case, uh, it is assumed to hit 3.5% uh, around 2030. So that is a significant increase um, and in line with, um, with the renovation wave. Um, Second, um, we looked at various different uh, technology pathways to supply the heating and cooling demanded by the building stock that we end up with uh, for both the low efficiency and the high efficiency variants. Um, and um, so these, um, these include um, electrification pathway, uh, relying mostly on the rollout of heat pumps uh, for decarbonization. Um, second, uh, a high gas pathway um, relying mostly on green hydrogen um, and green and hydrogen boilers uh, for decarbonization. Uh, we look at two versions of this, one with domestically produced green hydrogen and one with um, green hydrogen being imported from outside uh, the European Union. And then third, a mix of both electrification and green hydrogen uh, for the latter again in two versions, one with domestically produced green hydrogen and one with green hydrogen being imported from outside the EU. Um, this leads to 10 different scenarios in total that we've simulated, uh, for which the results can be, find, can be found side by side in the long technical report. Um, I should also say that in all scenarios, the power sector is completely decarbonized by 2050. In the, in the same way across all scenarios uh, through carbon trading and uh, taxation. Um, the baseline uh, reflects a business as usual situation uh, for renovations and technologies uh, in which the weighted renovation rate is the same as in the low efficiency variant and the technology shares are kept as they have been in recent years. So baseline is business as usual situation uh, without any, any ch real changes over time. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, please. Okay, and um, so this slide presents the different technology pathways in a bit more detail. Uh, in the electrification technology pathway, the take-up of heat pumps increases over time so that by 2050, 
uh, close to 50% of the energy needed for heating and cooling by residential buildings is produced uh, by heat pumps. In the high gas or hydrogen scenario, um, it is assumed that by 2050, 40% uh, of the energy needed for heating and cooling by residential buildings is produced by hydrogen boilers. The share of heat pumps is more or less kept at its current levels. Um, in the mixed scenario, the shares are 15% uh, for hydrogen boilers and 33% for heat pumps, uh, respectively. Um, so you have a electrification scenario, a hydrogen scenario, and then we also looked at a combination of hydrogen and, uh, and heat pumps, basically. Um, across the three pathways, uh, the shares for wood stoves or boilers and for traditional electric heaters are kept constant across the different pathways. Uh, because uh, there was relatively broad consensus among the experts that these will keep playing a minor role in whichever scenario. But the focus here is on the effects of changes in the comparison of dominant uh, zero carbon technologies, as they are, um, as the other ones are broadly the same um, uh, in all scenarios. Furthermore, um, because district heating is likely to play an important role in any scenario for heating decarbonization, uh, the share for district heating is also assumed to be the same across uh, the different pathways. The detailed breakdown of technologies used in district heating is not presented here, uh, but broadly follows the same trend as the overall pathway for a given scenario, yet allows a significant role for waste heat consistently. And then in the baseline, uh, there is no transition, as I've said, uh, to zero, zero carbon technologies by 2050. Although this is obviously not very realistic, the function of the baseline is to provide a consistent counterfactual uh, to which all other scenarios are compared. So let's look at some of the results. Uh, next slide, please. So the first set of results I'd like to show um, is that for final energy demand for heating. Um, in other words, the fuel and electricity uh, demanded for heating and cooling. Uh, the top four charts present the low energy efficiency variance uh, for each pathway, and the bottom charts present the high energy efficiency variance for each pathway. The numbers in the top right corners um, is the final energy demand uh, in 2050 expressed in uh, terawatt hours. As you can see, energy demand goes down considerably um, over time in all scenarios, which is driven by two factors. Uh, first, an improvement in the efficiency of the building stock over time, meaning that demand for fuels and electricity will go down just because of better insulation, et cetera. Um, this improved efficiency by itself accounts for around 50% reduction in the demand for fuels and electricity between 2022 and 2050. Second, more efficient than zero carbon technologies uh, require less input for the same output, essentially. Um, in particular, heat pumps are quite efficient, uh, thus not requiring as much um, watt hours uh, as hydrogen boilers or gas boilers to deliver the same amount of heat. This can be seen by the difference between the two graphs, um, second from left, uh, presenting the results for the electrif electrification pathway, and the two graphs, second from right, uh, presenting the results for the hydrogen path pathway. In the electrification pathway, what you end up getting is a plus or minus 75% reduction in the demand for energy uh, between 2022 and 2050 from the combined effects of energy efficiency, energy efficient buildings, and um, heat pump deployment. So that is a considerable, uh, considerable reduction in uh, the demand for, for electricity and fuels. Um, gas, uh, the area uh, in light blue, um, just to be clear, um, disappears from all pathways apart from the baseline. So that is natural gas. Um, so that completely disappears. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, we also project that um, the decarbonization of heating and cooling will lead to lower energy bills over time uh, because less energy will be needed uh, because of the two effects I have um, described um, when I talked about the previous slide. So one, efficient buildings and two, more efficient technologies. Um, 
In some cases, this will lead to savings of more than 50% in the annual um, energy bills between now and 2050, um, the, the electrification scenarios in, in particular. Um, before I get any questions about it, um, I should probably note that the values um, presented here are in real terms in order to compare across, uh, across years, across time. But of course, in nominal terms, the values on the right uh, will be much higher in uh, 2050. Um, next slide, please. When we take into account all costs related to owning and running a particular technology to heat uh, a home, uh, we get the following picture. Um, so that's total cost of ownership, as we call it. Um, the fossil fuel based technologies are generally cheaper in terms of upfront and installation costs. But because of the projected price increase for fossil fuels, uh, the energy bills for households using them uh, go up and they become relatively uh, more expensive over time. The same is true to a certain extent for hydrogen boilers. While, while they are expected to be cheaper than heat pumps in terms of the upfront and installation cost, the projected price of hydrogen suggests that over their lifetime, they are likely to be more expensive than heat pumps to run which come out as, uh, so the heat pumps come out as the cheapest technologies to use to heat one's home together with solar, uh, solar thermal. One small remark, in our modeling, we have simulated a decarbonized power sector and an ETS for transport and buildings, thus explaining the high prices for fossil fuels and uh, respective TCOs. In a way, this also means that the implementation of an emissions trading scheme for heating fuels um, can help certain uh, zero carbon technologies, um, such as heat pumps, uh, become cost competitive fairly soon. Next slide, please. Um, as said, the primary ob objective of the study has been to, uh, to simulate a decarbonization of heating and cooling uh, for the European residential building stock. Uh, so the graph presented uh, on this slide with direct CO2 emissions uh, shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. What it shows, though, is that the current total levels of uh, more than 300 megatons um, annually could be halved and brought to zero quite rapidly if the efficiency of buildings were to be improved and zero carbon technologies rolled out. In fact, this is the kind of rollout needed um, in order to meet EU's, EU's objectives uh, for CO2 emissions uh, reductions by 2030 for the building sector. Next slide, please. Um, however, while CO2 emissions can be brought to uh, zero through the projected changes and go down quite rapidly, uh, there will still be other pollutants being emitted in the process of heating and cooling homes. There's a difference here, though, between the technologies being used for that. Based on the latest available emission factors for the various technologies, our scenario suggests that relying on hydrogen boilers as the dominant technology would lead to roughly double the amount of NOx emissions um, annually compared to the electrification scenarios. Um, so um, yeah, the use of, um, of hydrogen boilers will still lead to considerable uh, NOx emissions. Um, the good news is though that uh, in both cases, the NOx emissions are lower than those produced at the, at the moment uh, and where uh, were gas boilers to remain uh, the dominant technology. Um, just to be clear, um, so in the electrification scenario, um, because we have um, wood stoves and other technologies still, um, most NOx, NOx emissions obviously come uh, from those technologies. Um, look, going to the next slide. Um, so looking at macroeconomic indicators, we see that energy renovations and the update of uh, the uptake of clean heating can have positive uh, economic impacts. Uh, there are three main factors that drive the changes in, um, in these, uh, for these uh, macroeconomic impacts. So first, uh, the transition to zero carbon buildings will require significant investments in new clean technologies um, and energy efficiency. These investments will generate costs, but also economic activity and employment uh, in Europe. Secondly, households will likely spend less 
um, of their disposable income on energy, which means that more money can be spent on other goods and services, which has also induced effects. Thirdly, by, by reducing demand and uh, dependence on fossil fuels, Europe will spend less on energy imports. As a result, in most of the scenarios explored, the transition to a zero carbon building stock leads to a net increase in gross domestic, domestic product compared to the baseline. However, the scale of the net increase varies between scenarios, with the scenario relying on heat pumps and lowering the need for heating uh, through a high increase in the renovation rate um, shows the most favorable, favorable GDP impact, leading to an additional 0.8% of annual GDP uh, by 2030 and a 1% increase in annual GDP by 2050. Renovating Europe's building stock and electrifying the heat supply will also help uh, create extra jobs by 2050, up to 1.2 million net additional jobs in the high energy efficiency and electrification scenario. So, um, yeah, so decarbonizing heating and cooling for the residential building stock um, will lead to an increase um, in, uh, in employment and in um, economic output over time, in particular in the electrification scenario. Um, then looking at um, employment, uh, if you could please uh, go to the next slide, employment by sector. Um, so most jobs are created in the construction sector and in the power sector, as well as engineering and manufacturing, while jobs will obviously be lost in the fossil fuel related industries. This picture is fairly consistent across the different pathways because of the bulk of the employment effects are driven by the renovation wave. wave. Um, however, there are some notable differences between the different uh, pathways. Basically, direct effects can be seen in the five bars on the left, um, while the additional jobs in services, distribution and retail in the two bars on the right are mainly driven by induced effects from saving and spending on energy, which are the highest in the electrification scenarios. The domestic production of hydrogen through electrolysis uh, generates considerable extra employment in the power sector, in particular in the period uh, that investments in hydrogen production are, are being ramped up. But when the hydrogen is being imported from uh, abroad, this effect um, largely cancels out, thus leading to much small, smaller employment gains in that, in that scenario. Uh, next slide, please. So the following slide illustrates that the transition to zero carbon heating and cooling will also have some small distributional effects as the transition affects household spending on heating and cooling directly and their disposable incomes indirectly through the wider impacts on the economy and employment. The first quintile here refers to the lowest income households, while the fifth quintile refers to the richest households. As you can see from this chart, the lowest income households would be slightly better off in all scenarios presented here, albeit that the effects are most positive in the case where heat pumps become the dominant technology. This is because low income groups spend a greater proportion of their income on energy and the use of highly efficient uh, heat pumps will lower their energy expenditure. The lower positive or negative effects um, that you see for the, for the higher quintiles are mainly driven by higher energy spending in absolute terms by these households and the distribution of renovation costs um, across property owners. Next slide, please, um, which brings us to the key conclusions uh, from the study. Um, so renovating the EU building stock will come with a high monetary cost, but this should not just be seen as a cost as it will come with considerable co-benefits including an investment stimulus, new jobs, reduced spending on energy and gas imports, lower emissions of CO2 and other pollutants, and positive effects uh, for public health. Such benefits are projected to be highest if the, renovation waves go, if the renovation wave goes hand in hand with the replacement of existent inefficient heating technologies with more efficient heat pumps, because this leads in normal circ circumstances at least to the highest savings in spending on energy for households which induces economic activity in other parts of the economy with higher value added. Domestic production of hydrogen also leads to 
uh, positive GDP and employment effects, but mainly due to high um, energy costs, these effects are projected to be much lower. In all scenarios, uh, residential heating and cooling is decarbonized, bringing direct CO2 emissions to zero by 2050. Nonetheless, NOx emissions um, still present a risk, in particular when hydrogen is used. The transition will also help reduce fuel imports from abroad, including countries like Russia. Our simulations suggest that reducing the energy needs of the building stock through renovations and switching to renewable heating could cut its spending on gas imports by 15 billion euros in 2030 and 43 billion euros in 2050 by phasing out fossil fuel heating. To give a bit more context, the amount of gas saved by 2030 relative to the gas consumed for heating in 2022 in the high efficiency scenarios and just from residential heating and cooling is roughly a quarter of the gas imported from Russia in 2020. And these import savings will, of course, increase further after 2030. Um, designing the legal framework and policies to foment wide scale energy re renovation, renovations and technology deployments should does not just be seen as a need by policymakers, but rather as an opportunity to improve our levels of well being within the EU in the short, medium, and long term. The question as to what kind of policies and legal framework is best suited to bring about these necessary changes, I will leave that to the policymakers on the panel today. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, there's one more slide uh, which, which summarizes the, the main um, economic uh, impacts, not, not just economic, but the main impacts uh, from the um, high energy efficiency and uh, electrification scenario, uh, which can also be found um, in the, the summary report. Um, so as you can see, um, it is projected that GDP in the EU 27 and UK increased by 1%. Um, Europe will spend less on uh, gas imports. Um, uh, the scenario will uh, create um, additional, additional jobs uh, by 2050 and before. Um, NOx emissions uh, uh, will be considerably, considerably uh, reduced um, and uh, there will be savings for lower uh, income households uh, that see their disposable incomes um, improve. And um, overall, um, yeah, energy bills uh, can be cut uh, accordingly. Um, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stein. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for, uh, for all your uh, work also in, uh, in, uh, in this team and also for, uh, for the results, which I think are pretty um, clear and indicative also of a way to go. But uh, without further ado, we'd like to come to maybe the most, um, um, probably not interesting, but certainly um, determined uh, or at least important um, part of our discussion. And that is an exchange of view with some of the people who cooperated to this um, study, but also with uh, Kieran Kufe, who is uh, um, a member of the European Parliament and the rapporteur on EPBD. Uh, for which I guess uh, these findings can have some kind of interest. Kiran, you have the floor, the floor. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I, it's fascinating to see such an interesting study uh, on the different energy paths that we could uh, go down. I was particularly uh, impressed with the divergence, obviously, between electrification and the use of hydrogen. Um, and really for me, what was striking was the amount of employment that could be generated uh, from electrification uh, and the degree to which uh, greenhouse gas emissions would be reduced. I was also intrigued to see uh, the reduction in pollution uh, from nitrogen dioxide. So, that, that really for me was not just a, a single point, uh, a treble whammy of greenhouse gas reductions, employment creation and pollution reduction. So I, I certainly found that uh, very impressive. Uh, and I think in a, in a period, in a month in which uh, we are seeing uh, not just the atrocities happening 
uh, in Ukraine, but also we're watching the EU to try and limit imports from, from Russia. But then do we increase our imports from places like Saudi Arabia, where 81 uh, men and boys were executed in one day last week? I don't think so. I think we have to rapidly ramp off, ramp down our dependence and reliance on fossil fuels. And it seems to me that the fastest way of doing this is with deep renovations where the focus is on uh, electrification. Uh, energy efficiency, electrification, to me, uh, this is certainly the way forward. So I think this puts a renewed focus on the Fit for 55 package within the European Union. Uh, I was at a meeting with Franz Timmermans uh, last week, and one of the points we touched on was rooftop solar for electricity generation. And there is certainly scope to ramp this up through the work on the revisions to the energy performance of buildings directive. I, I think every member state in Europe uh, is um, doing its best, doing its utmost to move as quickly as possible uh, away from uh, importing um, gas, um, oil and coal from, from Russia. Uh, and I think this is causing a seismic shift, particularly in Central Europe, where there was perhaps a resistance to embracing the green uh, revolution as firmly as North, Northern and Western Europe uh, are understanding this. So I think in the revised EPPD, uh, there are rollouts in the text that will reflect what I'm hearing today. And, and I think uh, more than ever before, uh, there will be a momentum amongst member states to increase their energy transition to renewables and to boost their renovation numbers. Increasing the renovation rate to 3.5% clearly will half the energy demand for heating uh, by 2050, but it'll bring major benefits in terms of energy security and tackling energy poverty, um, which is so important for uh, low income uh, households. I think we need to ensure that we implement minimum energy performance standards uh, in combination with financing to limit the cost for residents, which would accelerate the renovation rate in Europe. And uh, as I said before, alleviate uh, energy poverty. And we've seen this in Article 9 of the draft report, and I look forward to expanding on the provisions in uh, that article. Um, but we also need to examine the barriers to investment in energy efficient housing and those dwellings in most needs of renovation in line with the long term renovation strategies. Uh, and I think we can use the COVID recovery fund as an opportunity to create European flagship areas for investments and reforms with tangible benefits for the economy and for citizens across the EU. Do we need a second round of financing from the European Commission to fast track the changes that are required? I think that's up for grabs. Uh, and I, I, I think we do need member states to really um, boost the uh, amount of funding that is required. Um, and I hope that the various EU instruments, the European Investment Bank, European Central Bank Policy and European Bank for Reconstruction and Development will put their shoulders to the wheel on this. But I think the private sector will come in as well. If they can see um, firm legislation that gives certainty as to the trajectory over the next 30 years, sure, the rate of return is not as high as it might be in other areas, uh, but I think um, once we give legislative certainty, it will bring the private sector in at a, a far greater rate. Clearly in the short term, we need to ramp up the education and upskilling for both craftspeople and professionals alike. So we do need those training courses. We do need the education in the 
uh, construction sector. But look, the evidence and, and the, the takeaways from today, um, certainly they were floating around for a while. Uh, the work that I've seen from Adrian Heil and, and Michael Liebrich have shown that green hydrogen doesn't make sense. And I think this very grounded, uh, strong research is reinforcing this lesson that green hydrogen is not the uh, hydrogen is not the answer to home heating. There are better uses of that uh, in ammonia production, in uh, in certain refining industries, perhaps in steel. Uh, but for the moment, we need to electrify everything, uh, starting with um, the homes that we live in, and this will reduce our energy bills, create jobs, reduce local air pollution, uh, and be a win-win really uh, for everyone uh, that's involved. So as we, as we kind of emerge um, from a difficult winter uh, to a spring that has been dominated by conflict, uh, a conflict that has been fueled uh, by the revenues from oil and gas, I hope that we will look to increasing European energy sovereignty and the clearest, most effective way of doing that uh, is with electrifying our home uh, energy systems. So thank you, the researchers, for the work that, you've, uh, that you have undertaken, and it will certainly feed into the legislative work that I am undertaking on the EPBD. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Kieran. I think it's uh, very important in all this conversation and discussion to keep in mind, as you did, not only the job effects, but also the effect on the public debate of this issue, because we didn't win for the moment uh, the, um, the, 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 the conversation on, uh, on what is best to do in this very complicated and painful uh, situation we are in, in a quite unexpected way. And, at, and as uh, it was said at the beginning, um, the, by Femke, we, the, the study cannot, couldn't really foresee what, uh, what happened, uh, but it is important indeed to underline, as you did, that uh, this is even more, uh, it brings even more arguments uh, to, uh, to what we were trying to say, and we will have to find the right language to do so. And the fact that the political spectrum is aware of this is really very important. Thank you very much, uh, Kieran, for your, um, for your contribution. And now I would like uh, um, to uh, give the floor to um, Daniele Agostini, um, who is the head of energy and climate policy at Enel. Um, Enel is a very interesting uh, um, uh, company for us Italians is something that has always been there in our life basically, but it went through a very major change uh, that uh, also uh, Daniele brought in his contribution to this work, because in theory, um, utilities are not interesting in sparing energy, really. But uh, I think that this is also something that is changing. So, Daniele, you have the floor. Thank you for being here and for your work over this year. Yes. <clears throat> and of course, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the organizers, IASE uh, and the ECF, uh, for this, this opportunity, but also for this wonderful study. And indeed, and then we've been really uh, trying to look at the future. We've been looking at the future by pioneering uh, the first large utility, both the renewable energy space and now also the energy services space with NLX and exploring new ways of living and using energy. And in that sense, the study has been really enlightening in many ways. Uh, it was really an honor and a pleasure to be on the advisory panel of the study. I found the study to be particularly original because there are a number of studies that show the role of the building sector, but the granularity with which uh, the advisors, Cambridge Econometrics, uh, ECF, uh, uh, and EASI contributed to this research, but also the advisory panel, the granularity in terms of the age of the buildings, the segmentation, the geographical diversification, I think has been unique. Uh, the other part that's been really unique is the rigor with which the scope was, uh, was approached. 
traditionally, we've seen studies more focused on the greenhouse gas benefits and the economic return. Of course, we know sustainable development is more than just environment and economics, but it's social dimension that is today lagging behind and we need to really focus on this, on this dimension to make sure that we can upscale our action on climate. And the study tackles that dimension. It is a difficult dimension. As Mr. Kufi said, I agree with most of your comments. I think all of your comments are uh, very interesting, the, the, the impacts on the social dimension and also on other environmental variables like NOx that were highlighted by the uh, study. So um, again, uh, very interesting study on the three dimensions, the reduction of CO2, the reduction of NOx, which again have an important impact on the air quality in our cities. And it's so important that we also reduce the other pollutants. They are also very important because sometimes unfortunately citizens uh, are more focused on the short to medium term impacts of policies. And so abating NOx will definitely contribute to that extra incentives for policymakers to engage in in uh, decarbonizing and electrifying um, uh, buildings. So on the economics, quite impressive, impressive. They cut by half of the energy bills uh, with a special focus on low income households. Again, a very important aspect as we try to exit the pandemic crisis. And unfortunately, we're gonna go into a new uh, crisis, uh, we will have to pay special attention to the most exposed segments of our society. And um, on the social side, I was also quite impressed by bill, the, the employment analysis. Uh, that analysis very detailed. I thought it was particularly interesting uh, seeing uh, the, um, the breakdown of the value chain employment. If we look at the gain in employment, we see that manufacturing is only 10% of the overall gain. As you pointed out, there is a lot in the uh, construction sector, and there's a lot also in the power sector. And again, these are sectors that are local. Uh, some of the uh, opposition that have been made in the past to heat pumps is that often heat pumps, heat pumps are import technology, and we run the risk of doing the same mistakes that we've done with some of the renewable energy technologies, where we ended up creating jobs outside Europe. Instead, in this case, we see a focus of employment within Europe. And obviously the objective is to bring also the manufacturing part of the value chain in Europe. There are some excellence uh, points of excellence in this area. Um, I have some Italian ones, but, I, but uh, uh, also in Northern Europe, uh, there's a lot of work, especially on the engineering design and the system analysis of these electrified uh, buildings. Uh, from our point of view, I think it was important that the study focused on the building sector. However, as a utility, we see it as extremely important because electrification of building is linked to other sectors and can contribute in a system-wide dynamic to wider decarbonization of the economy. I'm thinking of the linking between the building sector and the transport sector. And the EPBD in that sense plays a very important role uh, as in uh, provide demand side response, but also charging for uh, cars and buildings. So buildings can become the hubs of a decentralized energy system. The hub uh, through recharge uh, services, uh, demand side response, of course, storage, storage in terms of thermal storage is huge. And in that sense, I believe that there's uh, the economics can be even more advantages for electrifying buildings once you take into account those extra revenues that come from uh, these type of services that you can provide either to the transport sector through recharging or to the electricity sector through demand side response. That extra remuneration uh, will actually make uh, accelerate the penetration of uh, electric technologies in heating and cooling of buildings. So we actually expect the process to be much stronger. What we're missing here is a regulatory framework, not so much in terms of policy. Uh, and I think at the European level, there's a big effort and uh, I think that will be well rewarded, but in terms of actually tariff regulation, making sure that that flexibility regulation is developed in all member states so that, that these investments in electrification can attract as uh, Mr. Kufevi, you were saying, even more investments from private sector as we build in these extra streams. 
Uh, there are, of course, some challenges. We are all facing them. I think the study uh, does works more if you want in identifying them, but uh, the non-economic challenges are the ones that are uh, today blocking uh, an acceleration of the penetration that we so badly need in the sector. And these non-economic barriers are in the construction industry. Often the construction industry in Europe is fragmented, small companies that uh, uh, are challenged with the training on new technologies. Uh, in your electric, I also chair the Electrification and Sustainability Committee. Your electric has recently signed for Skills for Climate, an initiative aimed uh, with other big industry players aimed at bringing those skills that also, Mr. Kufi, you were talking about, um, bringing those skills to also the small medium enterprises that often are challenged by change. The second big challenge is industry manufacturing. Uh, we see building electrification needs to be, the electrification of heating needs to be a part of a wider uh, system in the building. And uh, I think the, um, the smart readiness indicator um, by the European Commission is pioneering some of these concepts, how the different appliances can talk to each other, can talk to the network. We really may need to make sure that we facilitate the development of standards that uh, accelerate the way that these appliances talk to each other in order to make uh, the interaction seamless and more user friendly. Last but not least, of course, we have the users. Uh, we need major information campaigns. We need uh, uh, governments to provide more unbiased, clear, transparent information uh, as utilities manufacturers are doing their best, but in the end, uh, users uh, do look at the government for unbiased information information. And so it is important that governments really play a bigger role in providing that information. So again, um, I think a uh, uh, wonderful study, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, supporting uh, the penetration uh, of electrification and decarbonization of the building sector uh, by tackling some of these non-economic barriers that today are holding back industry. Thank you very much uh, again, uh, and uh, for back to you, Monica. Thank you very much, um, uh, Daniele. Indeed, this question of the non-economic barriers is very, is very high on the agenda, actually not only for energy efficiency, but also for, uh, for renewables. And, uh, and there, there are some kind of uh, uh, alliances that can be done in the sustainability, sustainable industry, uh, because we see that uh, this needs uh, very much a very high level political effort uh, but also uh, an implementation effort uh, at the lower level, but both have to go together because the high level is not that convinced anymore. And this is very worrying indeed. So I would like to give the floor now to Andrea Voth, who is the head of global public affairs at, at Danfoss. And Danfoss is a, 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 is a company which has been always supporting and are funding members of the EUEs. So Andrea, I give you the floor and thank you for being here and for having worked on this study. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, and uh, thank you again uh, for inviting me to speak at that panel. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything that was said already because uh, clearly this study is extremely timely and extremely useful, of course, um, also more so in the, in the current context. Um, I would just like to come back on a couple of numbers that um, Femke was mentioning in her introduction and which I think we always need to keep uh, in mind, um, which is first of all um, related to energy. Energy represents 75% of all greenhouse gas emissions um, in Europe. And uh, heating and cooling actually represents half of the total final energy consumption in Europe of which uh, roughly 80% is still based on fossil fuels. Electricity, on the other hand, represents 40% of the total final energy consumption and 60% is still based on fossil fuels. And we all know that most of those fossil fuels are imported. So very clearly, if we tackle heating and cooling, and if we massively phase in uh, renewables for uh, electricity production, then we can make a major contribution not only to uh, the climate goals, but obviously also to the energy goals, which are right now uh, very much at the focus of, of the public attention. 
Does this need to come at the expense of the consumers? We heard it very loud and very clear in the study. No, it does not. Um, specifically, when we look at heat pumps and electrification in buildings as one important solutions, solution, we heard that uh, it can actually halve uh, the energy bills um, in the coming years. And that, I think, is, a, is, of course, a major argument. Heat pumps can be very, very cost competitive because they save so much energy. Because for every little bit in energy you put into a heat pump, you multiply it by three or four or five, depending on the efficiency of the heat pump uh, in terms of the heating and or cooling that you can get out of it. So, so there are really major benefits in terms of uh, energy savings uh, with heat pumps. Um, and, um, and of course, by more deploying heat pumps, as both the IEA and the European Commission are uh, recommending, we will also achieve uh, significant economies of scale. But what I wanted to specifically highlight here as well is, um, is the different types of heat pumps and the interplay also with a more systemic approach, which I think uh, has a major role to play here. Because when we say heat pumps, very often we just think about uh, residential buildings and residential models, so the smaller heat pumps, um, which are, I think, uh, very much uh, at the top of people's minds when they hear heat pump. But that's not all. There are also large heat pumps, industrial heat pumps, commercial heat pumps, and such heat pumps can be combined, for example, with uh, district energy, which really uh, then uh, has uh, even a higher uh, impact on, on the benefits that we can achieve. And why am I saying that? If you look at district energy approaches, then um, you also mean it also means um, that uh, you support uh, the, the um, phase in of renewable energies. Because why am I saying that? Because um, a district energy approach also provides flexibility, it provides storage solutions, it provides also uh, the possibility to tackle peaks in, in demand. Um, and that, uh, of course, is also a topic when you switch on many devices and, for example, heat pumps all at the same time, then such flexibility is extremely important. And if you have big heat pumps combined with, with district energy, then this is even amplified because then we have these huge possibilities to, um, to, to add that flexibility and therefore to phase in the renewables, which are intermittent, as we all know, and, and not a stable energy supply. So, so lots of opportunities there. And of course, also on top of that, um, we also have the opportunity to use all energy sources, also low temperature energy sources, um, uh, which are uh, coming from excess um, energy, excess heat, excess cold, which again provides more, uh, more flexibility and reduces the need uh, to generate heating and cooling. So we have a lot of major benefits uh, in that sense. And it can be very well illustrated if you look at, for example, data centers. If you take a data center, you need to cool that data center. You can use a, a large heat pump to achieve that cooling. That large heat pump will generate uh, waste heat from the cooling process, which it can then be pumped up and fed into a district energy network. So, so you really close the loop there. And I think that's one of the key things that we still have to achieve, close the loop, make sure that we do not sink in silos, but that we really um, link those different uh, applications and possibilities with each other. And that also goes very much uh, in the sense of what uh, Daniele was saying before me, that the building in itself um, needs not to be seen as something in isolation, but really as something which is fully integrated into, into the energy system. That can even be better achieved if we combine it with uh, digital solutions, with controls, with building automation and control, which will further help address the flexibility, the storage, the intermittency of renewables, et cetera. So we really have the technologies at hand. It's just a matter of putting them together and make sure they work together with each other. How can we make that happen? A lot was said already, and, and Mr. Koff was really very clear in, in, in his outline on what he is going to focus in the, in the EPBD review. Um, so, so that's uh, great to hear, and it's, of course, spot on that as a company, um, it's really important to have this uh, regular 
regulatory certainty for investments and also for knowing on in which way uh, to move forward. So we have a major opportunity here with the entire Fit for 55 package, but specifically with the EPBD and also the EED to achieve this regulatory certainty and to direct uh, the investments into, into, uh, into the right direction. More specifically, what is it that we need? We need Clearly, we need ambitious uh, renovation targets. We need these uh, minimum efficiency performance standards for buildings because they will trigger and kickstart the need for renovation. And they need to be accompanied with clear milestones and roadmaps on, on how to move uh, forward. Then, of course, we also need a fast deployment of the basics and opening the doors for digital solutions, which will help achieve what I was saying earlier, putting the dots together and making sure it is all uh, connected. We also, and that again goes in the sense of achieving a systemic approach, we need systematic energy planning, where the stakeholders come together and, uh, and where um, for example, via heat maps, it's, it's really, uh, we take this holistic approach and look where is heat needed, where is heat generated, how can we bring it together? That's more a topic for the EED, but nevertheless, it's very important to mention it in, in, this, uh, in this context as well, that we need uh, mandatory heat maps. Then, of course, we need to address barriers. A lot was said already beforehand. Um, one of the barriers which is uh, often mentioned uh, in connection with heat pumps is the high higher uh, investment cost for a heat pump. As I was saying earlier, this will go down with, when we have uh, economies of scale, but there are also financial models which will help addressing this, like, for example, ESCOs. And there, again, we have a major opportunity in the EPBD um, to, uh, to further, um, to further uh, build uh, the, the ground um, for broader deployment for ESCO models as well. And finally, extremely important uh, also um, the skills. Uh, we need uh, people who can make it happen on the ground. Otherwise, this is going to remain a paper exercise uh, where uh, nothing is, is happening in reality. So again, there are a lot of uh, Im important uh, hooks in the different legislative frameworks that are being uh, revised right now. And I think it's really extremely important to put a major focus on, on, on the skills side of things as well. So um, thank you again for, uh, for, for the great study that we have. I think we should promote it as much as possible, uh, Monica and, uh, and the ECF, <laughs> and make sure that uh, those messages are heard loud and clear so that we can achieve what we have already at hand, deploy our technologies and connect the dots. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least in our panel, I would like to give the floor to Monique Goyens, who is the Director General of the European Consumer Organization. And I'm particularly glad to be able to welcome her uh, in, uh, in this event. Monique, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Monica, for these nice words. And thank you very much for inviting me. I think it's really important for the consumer perspective to be part of that conversation, because uh, when you refer to systemic uh, thinking, well, don't forget the last mile and uh, consumers are key in the energy transition. If you really want to succeed in all those systemic changes that need to take place, decentralization, storage, investment into renewables, investment into renovation. So it's really important to have us on board and we welcome that very much. And first, let me say congratulations to the study. This is really well done and uh, it couldn't be more timely than now. And we certainly very much uh, welcome the results. And what I would like to say is Direction is clear. Europe needs to phase out gas urgently. Uh, this has become more urgent than ever. It's not only about the climate, it's about our economics, it's about geopolitics. So it's really important to do that. And the first thing that I would like to say, and it has already uh, been mentioned by several, by several speakers, and certainly by Kiaran, is energy efficiency. From the consumer perspective, it's the renovation, the retrofitting of houses that is the biggest priority. And uh, it has already been said, it does not happen overnight. It takes a lot of time uh, and the clock is ticking. And we should, uh, again, quoting uh, Kiaran, fast track the procedure to push people, to support people into uh, the retrofitting uh, process. What we see is that there are currently for residential customers, uh, a lot of barriers, really. I mean, financial, of course, that, that's the no brainer, but also awareness and, and um Daniele mentioned it, sorry. Um, it's about consumer information, who informs people. And there is a lot of 
fake news in that context where there is not necessarily the right advice that is being uh, given to people. And that's why information is of course key, but it is not enough. You need beyond financial barriers, beyond information barriers, you need also to assist people in, um, in making those choices. You need really to help them overcome the barriers. And there is a lot of red tape currently if you want to install some of those renewables, for example. And so there is a lot that can be done and that must be done now in order to push people into retrofitting their houses because the you know energy efficiency is the first thing if you want to be less dependent on energy produ productions. And there, we really think that there should be a, a big push, public push in terms of putting uh, money uh, at the disposal of this renovation wave and uh, the, the new repower uh, initiative of the commission goes into the right direction. But there is still more gains of companies that have made a lot of profit over these last months uh, to maybe be reinvested into helping people to make their uh, energy uh, future, uh, the houses uh, future fit. But also uh, the private sector, banking sector should be pushed into uh, much more, uh, let's say, affordable and interesting, attractive green loans. Um, there is one good news that I would like to share with you, because we have also made a, a study last year uh, about um, the total cost of ownership of different um, uh, heating and cooling devices. And there, um, you know, you don't necessarily, depending on where you live, you don't necessarily have to invest into deep renovation in, in order to have uh, an attractive, efficient um, heat pump system, for example. So that, that's also something, uh, it's not necessarily everywhere in Europe that um, the renovation of the house needs to be really like high price in order to uh, to make that really worth it. So that's very important uh, to mention. Um, what, what we would like to say in this context, because we hear a lot of noise, certainly uh, around uh, the Fit for 55 package. And what is very clear from this study and was also uh, very clear by our own study is that hydrogen is not a viable option for residential heating. Don't go that route. It is very clear. It would lock consumers into a very expensive energy, energy future without any advantages for the environment. Uh, and we have seen that uh, in our study last year that the cost of, uh, of heating would be up to 120% um, uh, higher with uh, hydrogen heating than with uh, uh, electric heat pumps. And uh, that was without uh, being aware of, you know, the explosion on energy prices that has taken place over the last uh, months, and it's not going to stop so soon. So we believe that hydrogen is certainly part of the energy mix in a, in a system, in a system uh, but it should uh, only use to, for those sectors where decarbonization is not easy and where, where no, no other uh, alternatives exist. And also, uh, there is a lot of talk about blending of hydrogen into the, uh, in, into the gas grid. And we also believe that that would be, for consumers, for the residential customers, an expensive step that would lead nowhere. So uh, it increases cost without any other uh, benefit. So um, that means that for the gas package that is uh, being discussed for the moment, there should be no incentive being provided for blending energy and uh, hydrogen in the gas grids. And also a very important point, you need to ensure that uh, residential gas users do not pay for the rollout of the hydrogen network. So there could be a temptation. I mean, they're not going, they should not use it. So uh, there, should, there could be a temptation for having them pay by the price and by uh, possible taxes and levies that are going to be imposed on customers. Uh, people should be protected against the rise of energy prices and people should also be protected against the, the push towards hydrogen that is not at all into the interest. And can I say there, there is a very vocal lobbying going on, uh, pushing for hydrogen. Uh, I'm in the lobby, I'm in the EU policy and, and lobby bubble since many, many years. And a lobby uh, group being vocal does not necessarily mean that that lobby group is credible and has a, a, a significant constructive solution to bring. It only means that it's very well organized. So uh, I would really uh, like to insist on that the, the future for residential users is energy efficiency and electric heat pumps, combined, of course, with all the new technologies, with storage, uh, dynamic pricing, flexible energy demand. Thank you very much. 
Monique, oh, sorry. Thank you, Monique. Indeed, this question of the vo loud voices um, is, is an issue. Uh, it's not only well organized, but also well funded, which uh, in some cases makes a difference. Um, and indeed, I think that uh, the fact of being able to bring facts, numbers, and experiences, uh, it's, it's something that, uh, that can help, at least. Um, and uh, I believe also that uh, now we have some time, we have about uh, 15 minutes. I am not sure is, um, if uh, some of our speakers, Kieran and others, would like to take the floor above all those who intervene first um, on, on what uh, other speakers said. Um, Kieran, I don't know uh, if you want to make some comments more. Yeah, just to, to thank the, the other speakers, uh, I saw a question in there about the uh, phase out of uh, gas boilers. Look, I, I, I'd like to see that, but there may well be uh, both political and um, legal opposition uh, to doing that. Uh, I think the best thing we can do is really uh, get the price uh, of heat pumps to the right point where the consumer will embrace them. Uh, and I think the events of recent days will, will help uh, in, in that regard I, I i i think as always the more we can do with carrots rather than sticks the better it will be but clearly our role as legislators does have to uh, push us towards the the climate targets that we wish to achieve but we have to bring the public with us uh, and i think certainly over the last month there is now huge worry out there, um, genuine concern um, from the consumer as to how they will afford their energy bills in the coming months and years. And I think we have to listen very carefully to those concerns in any legislative uh, changes uh, that we make. Um, look, I'm in broad agreement with what others uh, have been saying. Uh, on the call. Um, I think this is a watershed moment uh, and perhaps there are two paths we can go down. We can in some sense panic and find our fossil fuels elsewhere and embrace solutions that are not sustainable or we can listen very carefully to the evidence base for the choices that we have to make. Uh, and I think that's why this study is so important. It gives us a grounded evidence base for comparing the different policy choices that are out there. Uh, and I think that's why it is so important. I leave it at that for the moment. Thank you very much. Any other comments before I go to a couple of uh, questions that I see on the chat? I was just, uh, Monica, gonna comment. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, I think, um, thank you. It, it was a uh, very interesting interventions after mine and I'm glad to hear that the supply chain of uh, heat pumps is stronger in terms of manufacturing moving to Europe, uh, Andrea. And uh, so I'm looking forward, we're looking into, we're soon gonna become members of the European Heat Pump Association. So we're very much, uh, supportive of this process. And uh, I, I remember maybe my, my information is a bit outdated. That's why we're joining the European Heat Pump Association. But um, uh, Monica, obviously I agree with uh, all of your uh, statements and uh, on blending, uh, I think it's, it's a particularly important one. Uh, as Enel, we do believe that hydrogen plays a very important role in the energy transition. However, we are not very optimistic over its availability. We believe it's gonna be a scarce resource and it will have to be focused on the hard to abate sectors of industry uh, where other uh, energy vectors are not available. So um, we completely share your, your, your position on blending. And I think it's very important that within Europe, we do a bit of a reality check on realistically how much hydrogen can be produced and supplied. So I think obviously this 
study was focused on the building sector and it wasn't really looking at the opportunity cost of if you use hydrogen in the building sector, what's gonna to happen to the hard to abate sectors? You're taking away a precious resource from sectors that I cannot decarbonize otherwise. So I just wanted to comment on that. I think it's very important that on volumes, uh, you know, we, we do a reality check on where we use that hydrogen. Um, and instead, I think heat pumps, uh, Mr. Kofé, are already in the money, as they say. It's just a question that those non-economic barriers make it harder for, it, uh, for heat pumps to penetrate as quickly as we need them to penetrate. And I saw also a comment from a friend, Thomas Novak, from the European Heat Pump Association on how convenient heat pumps are or not. But our finding, again, is those inf that information that Monique was referring about that is holding back our uh, potential customers to buy the heat pumps that today we're offering on the market. And as a utility, we offer that service of providing the full system. Yes, indeed. Um, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very welcome uh, consideration because beside the question of, uh, of, um, of the convenience uh, of, of other, other kind of uh, technologies in relation to what is thought to be more convenient today, which is basically going around and looking for more gas somewhere else, um, there, there, is, uh, there are some objective issues to be addressed uh, before we can extend, not before, but uh, that make it uh, uh, more difficult uh, to um, push very much quick, you know, for the installation of heat pumps everywhere. And I think that this is an issue that we all have to address as quickly as possible, but maybe Andrea wanted to intervene exactly on this point. Andrea. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And and I will afterwards, if you don't mind, uh, Monica, also perhaps briefly uh, give the floor to to Thomas, who is in the chat um, and wanted yeah. to comment on the on the cost of heat pumps as well. So what what I wanted to say is um, coming back on the fact uh, that um, heat pumps are imported. Daniela, you all already came back on it a little bit, but I just wanted to really state this very clearly that um, of course there are heat pumps which are. Um, imported and we see this a lot with the so-called air-to-air models uh, of many of which are coming from from asia clearly but on the other hand we do have a lot of heat pump manufacturers in europe as well and uh, and i think uh, with the recent developments um, we will further see uh, see their activities grow and and expand so it's not just an imported technology it's really a european one as well or perhaps for the start it uh, <laughs> it, it comes from here so so I think um, that is a, a very important point to make. And the other point I wanted to make is on, um, on the electricity. Um, you also mentioned that beforehand, Daniele, one of the barriers to heat pumps has also been, I'm, I'm living in Belgium, and if you make the calculation, then it's simply not so super um, interesting to run a heat pump because the electricity is so expensive versus, uh, versus what you have uh, in terms of a gas boiler, for example. So, so I think uh, one of the main uh, barriers that need to be taken away are those differences and is the fact to make uh, electricity uh, cost competitive, which will then impact, of course, anything which is going to be electrified, because this will bring the cost down. And I'm repeating myself, but as we as we move to more uh, renewables in order to generate our, our electricity, um, the more flexibility we can provide and the more we can uh, avoid peaks in the system, the more we can also bring the cost down because at the end of the day, it will, uh, it will prevent um, in, uh, investments into infrastructure, which will then be at the end of the day borne by, by the customers. So I think, again, coming back on what I said beforehand, it's, it's really about connecting the dots and creating this, this level playing field uh, that we so much need. And I'm sure Thomas uh, wanted to say something uh, on, on the cost as well. Well, normally, yes, he's in the chat, which is why I, if I could, I think you need to give me the microphone, he's saying. So. Just a minute, I will give him the possibility to speak. Well, as we oh, wait for okay. Thomas, just wanted to, to get back to Andrea. Yes, I think obviously there is a problem with the tariff structure 
Uh, there's also a lot of charges and taxes and fees that are uh, you know, uh, put on the electricity bill that shouldn't be there. I'll just give you an example. In Italy, we actually have the tax for televisions that goes on an electricity bill. And there's other examples of undue charges that end up on the electricity bill that shouldn't be there. And as your electric, we've been pushing for a long time uh, on that. Uh, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a European solution to it. We get it into the European, uh, the revision of the energy tax directive. Uh, but the, the answer by DG tax was like, well, no, that's more regulatory. Each member state does however they want. So they couldn't actually put at least some guidelines. And we're still trying some guidelines in that revision to say that the taxes on energy should reflect the use of energy and shouldn't include instead other things. But uh, I completely agree with you. And it's that part of that uh, regulatory review that we really need to do to make sure that tariffs are cost reflective. So the actual cost of electricity is reflected today is all very often, too often inflated. But I'm sure that Thomas has also some insights on that. Okay, Thomas, go ahead. Oh. Thank you very much, Monica, and everybody else to, to allow me to join this prestigious panel. Great study, and, and I can agree only to most of the comments, if not all, that were, have been made. Lucky also to see that this is a lobby group uh, of different bodies that is also quite vocal and I hope well organized, maybe not as well funded as the others that you mentioned, but sometimes better tactics and good ideas can also help overcome. Um, I just wanted to say a few things on this cost situation because we're, we are hearing it all the time. Just make these heat pumps cheaper. That would solve all the problems. I, I need to caution you on that one because the heat pumps have become much better and everybody in this industry will tell you that now we have heat pumps that are much more efficient. You can see that you can use them as direct replacements in existing buildings. They are, uh, they are more silent. They are better to connect to the electric grid, which we will need to provide uh, demand-side flexibility. But all this costs money. And also, they had to review the whole refrigerant um, that was used in the, in the product, which also means new compressors, new uh, components, et cetera. So what I would say is we can expect economies of scale just now if we have a bit of um, care taken by policymakers not adding new pieces of legislation. We need some, some uh, calm waters, is, if you would say, in, in the sailing business to develop the technology and really to uh, upgrade manufacturing capacity and then reduce, uh, then implement economies of scale. We can, of course, also optimize along the value chain, coming up with new business models, uh, maybe integrating installers into the manufacturing value chain, and hence reducing some of the inefficiencies that are uh, happening when you move a product between too many uh, players. What I would like to say, however, is that if you, if you try to understand what the true cost of heating is, then the heat pump is not too expensive. It's just the gas that is far too cheap. If we would make take a long-term perspective over 15, 20 years and include a CO2 price into the discussion, then the cost that you have to pay for a gas boiler today, not even integrating the recent increases in cost, and the heat pump would be roughly the same. So if we would get what uh, Daniela has said and some others, a reduction of electricity taxation and an increase in cost for the counterfactual, we would already be very happy. Thank you. Uh, Monique, you also asked for the floor. I just wanted to, before you do, you, you I give you the floor, uh, because I think that this is, uh, no, I give you the floor and then, because there's one question that I would like uh, some of you to answer, because it's quite interesting from Almut. But uh, go ahead, Monique. Yes, thank you. I, I try to be short. And in fact, I, I want a little bit to build up what uh, Andrea had said, and, and also uh, Thomas now, because I think that this previous conversation really illustrates also the struggle that people in real life, you know, the real people have because they, uh, there is no stability because, you know, sometimes you have a subsidy and then they, they change the subsidy system. Uh, the, the energy bill becomes a tax slip, like Daniela said. And in Belgium, for example, residential cos customers pay in their energy bill the, the street lights. Uh, it's not the industry who pays that, it's the residential consumers. Huh? So uh, this is also something that is not normal. But then you also, I mean, if you really want to have a very efficient energy system in your house, now you need to combine solar 
the heat pump storage in even your electric car, if you have one, uh, will soon become part of that whole integration. Uh, and you, know, you need to do that with, with a smart metering system or a smart demand side system. And that, I mean, the average consumer is not able to handle that. It's a jungle of red tape. It's a jungle of technical information. And that's why we are pleading to really have uh, an advice system that is put in place across Europe. We call it one-stop shop. Uh, a system that can really help people uh, navigate uh, and make it even fun. Because at the end of the day, once you get into it, it's fun uh, to be part of that solution and to be part of the system. So let's make energy efficiency fun and, um, and help people uh, in really rolling out the best system. It's good for them. It's good for their health. It's good for the environment. It's good for geopolitics. So uh, at all levels of the, of the chain, it, it is welcome. But, so you, but you need to support them on the ground, not just, uh, can I say, uh, in political speed, speaking. You need to really do it, deliver on the ground. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Monique. I think that, that is a real challenge, but I would like, uh, if you allow two minutes uh, before I do my conclusion, which would be also two minutes, Almut asks one question that in part was addressed, but I would like probably to go a little bit uh, uh, further in that, and that is, um, we are talking about speed of deployment and how fast we will be able to reach some results, because this is the most important argument that the gas uh, supporters say, we need the solutions now. And then we go to see, and indeed the solution of finding new gas will last at least one or two years at the minimum. So um, the, the question of Almut is uh, um, um, that, that the market capacity are considered to be too low to speed up building retrofits and installing of heat pumps. And I would like to know from your experience above all from the operators, if this is actually true. Um, and if this is true that there are bottlenecks, are there bottlenecks more on the demand or in the supply side? Uh, and I think that this could be something interesting to, uh, to, to further develop what we are talking about. I don't know if anybody would like to answer this question or if we have to leave it for a further conversation. Stain or uh, Femke or some others? Um, you know, from, from our side, I have to say that the demand, uh, we, we find the demand quite high. Um, but there are some of those non-economic barriers, those information barriers yeah. it was talking about where the word of mouth is more on efficient uh, gas boilers rather than uh, heat pumps and the benefits it brings. Or for instance, uh, the permitting process sometimes is, is uh, challenging. So on the demand side, uh, we, we see a lot of demand, but it ends up often in shallow renovations rather than in the deep long-term energy efficient uh, renovation that we're looking for. Uh, many of the countries in which we operate, especially now with the uh, uh, recovery and resilience funds, uh, there is a lot of renovation being funded and there is a real risk that this renovation is not real efficient and it ends up locking in uh, technologies that are not fit uh, for the future or for decarbonized future. Yes, and in the meantime, Monique put on the chat the study uh, on uh, goodbye gas and heat pumps will be cheapest. So um, if there are no other people who are asking for the floor, I just would like to say a few words to conclude our, our, um, our conversation, which will certainly not be the last. Um, first, I would like uh, to encourage you to use actually the numbers that are in this report, because I think that they are quite simple and effective uh, and uh, very well founded and grounded. And I think that we do need uh, very concrete points to be used in the, in the debate. Um, secondly, I would like to underline that in the, in, the, in the text, it is also in the reports, in the both of them, it is also made very clear that there are the multiple benefits uh, of uh, energy efficiency seen in all its, um, its, uh, its element. And since we are living in a competitive world, that is to say that things that we thought were no more competitive are coming back and say that they are still part of the future, uh, gas, but also in some cases coal, I think that these kind of arguments and figures should absolutely be used in order to motivate the need to accelerate and not to reduce the speed of all this deployment, because as somebody said at the beginning, 
these all things, these are all issues that will not fall from the sky. They need to have a very clear mind, a very clear intention, funding, but also a regulatory, uh, a regulatory scheme. And this is the actually, um, this is the main um, uh, way also to reach the socioeconomic results that we have to underline all the time. And that uh, also because of geopolitical uh, um, elements went a little bit behind the scene, but that are very important to be underlined in order to have the support of people. With this, I would like to thank you very much. Um, we are going. We are going to issue. A, we actually issued a, a press release on this. But please do use as much as possible these uh, these figures and this text. And we will be very much in touch with you, Kiran, but also with you, Monique and Daniele and uh, and the others. Thank you very much to Femke, to Stein, to Luigi, and to the team of UE's ECF and uh, um, uh, Cambridge Econometrics for this very nice piece of work and I wish you a very nice day and a very nice week with all uh, the circumstances of course that we are all living through okay thank you ciao ciao